nice, nice group of people. Welcome to our church today. If you're a guest, we hope you will take the time to reach in the pew right in front of you. There are cards and fill one out and leave it in or put it into the collection plate when it comes. We love to know who comes. We love to have a record of you. And we're always wanting you to know that you're welcome. And we truthfully are thrilled that you're here today. We have a special welcome this morning. We have a guest speaker today. His name is Dr. Keith Felton. He's sitting on the front row here. You'll meet him a little bit later. But um, if you would like to know more about him, we have an insert in the bulletin that you could skim over and look, take it home and memorize it and hold him to it later. If he ever says, well, no, I didn't do that, you say, well, you said you did. This. Anyway, if you'll allow me just one moment, I would like for our members of our pastor search committee to please stand. Some of them. Here, Dan. Dan. I want to thank them for their year-long huge number of committee meetings, work that they've done, uh, obviously a very dedicated and loyal group. I would not feel good if I didn't add one more person to that, and that's our church secretary, who has absolutely supported everything that we did and backed us 100%. So, thank you, Karen. Let us open our service now with prayer. If you would join me, please. Our Father, we thank you for your love, for your mercy, and for your patience with us. Thank you for your church and its members. And we ask you this morning to please have your Holy Spirit enter our hearts and our minds today so that we may do your will for our church. All of these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, open your bulletin now, and we're going to do a responsive reading. You will read the bold print. We come this day hoping to encounter Christ. We come with questions that only He can answer. May we open our hearts to Him. Amen. Thank you. Good morning again. If you would, please grab a hymnal in front of you and turn to hymn number four, To God Be the Glory. We're going to sing all three verses. And if you're able, I would ask that you please stand.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come to your house and worship. We thank you for your guiding hand that has provided to the uh, search committee, bringing us Dr. Keith. Be with Brother Keith as he brings us our message. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. again. It's so nice to see this place full, isn't it? Um, we're going to sing uh, page 208, and we're singing verses 1, 2, and 4. You may be see stay seated while we sing, and I'll get we are blessed to come together and worship you today. As we gather as your church, we pray for your peace and wisdom to fill our hearts and minds. Let us be cheerful, generous givers, and may our tithes and offerings be a reflection of the love we have for you and our desire to further your kingdom here on earth. In your name I pray, amen.
time together. If y'all want to come on down and see what we have this morning. Good morning, Kennedy. Just have a seat there, Kennedy. <clears throat> There's Miss Page, my friend Jace. No, not back there. Hey, Jace, come on down here. We're gonna we're gonna look at the table today. And there's Kennedy and all her friends, girls, girls. You're not gonna be able to see up there. Come on down. There you go, Hallie. Sit down here on the floor. <clears throat> all righty. I have this morning a pumpkin with me. And I bet you all of you in the last week or two have had a pumpkin at your house. Maybe you carved one. I bet you've been to a pumpkin patch. Has anybody go to a pumpkin patch this year? Yeah, and what was the criteria that you used to pick out a pumpkin? That means what were the things you were looking for? A pumpkin. I know, but what made you pick that pumpkin? How did you decide which one to take? Hmm. When it's orange. It was orange. Is that bothering you, Paige? That my pumpkin is not quite orange. No. How about if it was big? I have been to the pumpkin patch with a lot of boys and girls in my teaching career. And you know what they always picked? What? The biggest one they could find. Not the biggest one they could carry, <laughs> the biggest one they could find. Well, I picked this one because <clears throat> I kind of like the different. I kind of, it's green, it's unusual, it, it looks different, it's maybe a little bit different shaped, just like you all. And you know, the, huh? Bumpy. It's a little bumpy, yeah. Um, you all are like that. You're a little different. Nobody looks exact. We don't have a set of twins here today. Everybody looks different. And when God chose you, he made you to look exactly like you are and a little bit different from everybody else. Well, then when I got to carving, what, what color do you think this pumpkin is on the inside? Green and orange. You think it's green? It's the same as every other pumpkin. It's just the same. And you know, when we um, are selected by God and we give our heart to God, we're still a pumpkin, but we got some stuff. I'm going to take my ring off. We have some stuff in here ugh, that needs to come out. Like what? Like when it, well, it's our seeds and things. But like when we give our heart to Jesus, we have some sin that needs to come on out of there. And we have to talk to Jesus about it and he forgives us. We know that. And he gets it on out of there because it's, it's yuck. And then, ooh, if I can get off this little tiny stool. Then when we have our heart to Jesus, we have eyes that can see him and shine through. And then we have a mouth that we can speak about Jesus. And then you know what we do with the candle. And then we can what, Kennedy? We can let God's light shine. And it should shine out of our mouth and shine out of our eyes. We should have God's love doing that for us when we give our heart to Jesus. Okay, so this is the gospel according to the pumpkin. <laughs> not really, that's not in the Bible. Okay, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> but us giving our hearts to Jesus and then getting rid of our sin and then letting our eyes and our mouth speak about him, that is in the Bible. Can we pray this morning together? Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for all these wonderful boys and girls who are so different and so smart and so beautiful. And you made them all. And we are so thankful that their mamas and daddies brought them here this morning. Help us to be the church that helps nourish them and make them one day walk down that aisle 
to give our hearts to Jesus. And all these things we ask in your name. Amen. You may go with Miss Lucy. Thank you, Karen. If you have your Bibles this morning, I would encourage you to pull them out now and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 3. If you don't have your Bible with you in front of the pew, excuse me, in front of you in the pew, you should find a pew Bible, and you'll find this passage beginning on page 863. But we're going to be reading from the chapter, uh, third chapter of John, verses 1 through 21. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I have said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has <coughs> ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God.
Well, that was beautiful. One of my favorite hymns. Appreciate the music so much. Now, y'all don't tell Miss Karen this, but that was a, a, you can tell her, it was an absolutely fantastic children's sermon, but I'm afraid some of the kids are going to think, if I ask Jesus into my heart, I'm only going to have two teeth. <laughs> I hope that doesn't scare them away from walking down the aisle. No, that's uh, it's been a fantastic morning of worship already. Uh, for the astute among you, you already guessed, my name is Keith Felton, and uh, I am so honored to be here. I am thrilled, excited, I'm humbled, uh, but most of all, I am grateful. And I want to uh, reiterate what Bob uh, said moments ago, and that is you have a fantastic pastor search committee. I don't know where you found these men and women. Uh, but they need to write the book on uh, doing search committee, at least from my perspective. It was such uh, an excellent time. It was uh, a time where I felt, uh, I said this yesterday, but I just felt at home with them. And, and uh, they were so professional and just did their job very, very well. So I don't know what you'll do for them. I hope you throw a party and, and thank them and some of you are thinking, well, I'm not thanking anybody yet until I hear this dude <laughs> preach. Uh, and that, that's okay, too. Um, but I, I know a lot of attention uh, has been given to me this weekend, uh, and I understand why. Uh, but what has happened here this morning is what I hoped would happen, is that our, our attention, our focus, our worship is given to the only one who is worthy of that worship, and that's Jesus the Christ. And so I'm grateful for what has happened uh, before this uh, sermon moment. And speaking of the sermon moment, it's time to get down to business. And I like to say a prayer uh, before I preach. So join me in the prayer. Almighty God, I pray that you'll take the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth. And may they be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I hope that you will open up back to the Gospel of John this morning, chapter 3. And even for those who've never opened up the Bible, I think that they may recognize one verse in our key text this morning. Probably the most recognizable biblical verse there is, and that's John 3.16. For those of you who have grown up in the church, it may be, uh, the first verse that you memorized as a child, whatever the case, it is so famous and, and we see it everywhere. And for those that haven't even looked at the Bible, uh, they may be familiar with those words. Because I think, and this is what I call it, I think it could rightfully be called the gospel in a nutshell. John 3, 16. We all, y'all say it with me uh, this morning. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. It's all right there, isn't it? Absolutely. 
And so I love John 3.16. Now it's important and it's good uh, that we have that verse memorized, ingrained in our heart. But this morning I want to challenge you and I want to encourage you uh, to, to memorize the context of this verse. And you've already heard the context uh, read uh, from that famous chapter, John chapter 3. Um, and of course, it has uh, the most interesting biblical character, and that is Jesus. But I want us to think about today another really fascinating character that I have grown to love over the years, and that is Nicodemus. Nicodemus, man, what a what a fascinating guy. And he's not just any guy, especially in his time and space, especially among the Jews in that religion. Uh, he, he was a member of what was called the Jewish ruling council. He would have uh, been a Pharisee. He was a man with power. He was a man with authority. He was a man with clout. And when he wanted things to get done, they could get done, especially among those in the Jewish religion. Now this is significant. Why? Uh, that's because Jesus is a Jew, right? Uh, but, but Jesus didn't have the greatest relationships with the uh, folks in authority in Jewish circles. In fact, some of Jesus' harshest criticism uh, was reserved for the Pharisee. We know that if we have uh, read the New Testament. But in our story, here's a Pharisee. Uh, here's, uh, here's one wanting to meet with Jesus. Now what's interesting about this meeting is two things for me is, first of all, he wants to meet with Jesus alone. Usually you see a crowd of Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, they're coming in a, in a gang, so to speak, uh, to, to talk to Jesus or to listen to him or to argue against him. But here's Nicodemus, and he wants to come by himself. And then there's another element here that if, if, we, if we're not careful, we could gloss over. And that is that Nicodemus wants to meet at night. Now, for us, having a nighttime meeting, that's not a big deal. But for Nicodemus, in his time and space, it was a really uh, big deal. Um, you, were, you were suspect of wanting the cover of darkness for this meeting. It, it, it kind of reeked of underhandedness that, that something not right was going on. Obviously, Jesus took the meeting anyway, right? One of, one of the reasons I think Jesus took the meeting, even though it was at night, is that I think Jesus must have seen something, must have sensed something uh, that he didn't see in other Pharisaical leadership with Nicodemus. Because unlike he did with, with other Pharisees, Jesus didn't immediately go into the terminology of brood of vipers, right? He, he, has a, he has a gentler tone with Nicodemus. He has a more explanatory way of, of saying things to Nicodemus. And, and, of course, Jesus was right. I, I believe he was right to manage this conversation, this particular conversation, in that way to have a gentler tone with Nicodemus because what we'll figure out is that this conversation, this dialogue, had a tremendous impact on Nicodemus um, over the next few years. Now, why do I say that? Why do I know that it had a big impact? On Nicodemus. Well, uh, we don't know much more about Nicodemus, but we do hear his name a couple of more times in the New Testament. So if, and you don't have to turn there uh, this morning, but the next time we hear about him is in chapter 7 of the Gospel of John. The, the rest of the Pharisees, the context of that uh, portion of the text is th they had been scheming. Uh, the Pharisees had been scheming, planning, trying to figure out a way to wrangle this Jesus guy in. Uh, they were afraid he was becoming revolutionary, riotous. They, they were thinking the worst of this guy, that he was going to pull the rug of power out from under them. And they were fighting among themselves. But something happens during that conversation because Nicodemus rises up and he says, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? Sounds a little like Nicodemus is defending Jesus there, just a little. 
but I, I imagine his question went over like a lead balloon with his colleagues. But, but when is the next and last time we hear the name Nicodemus? Do you remember? Well, Nicodemus was there at the bitter end, right? I want to read from John chapter 19. You don't have to turn there, beginning in verse 38. Listen to what it says. After these things, after the crucifixion, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, asked Pilate to let him take the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus, they wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews, and they laid Jesus in a tomb which no one had ever been laid. There's the last time we see Nicodemus. Why do I take time to read that? Why, why do I point out that Nicodemus shows up at the end of Jesus' life? I believe it is because Jesus and the gospel, the dialogue that Jesus had with Nicodemus, and I don't know if Jesus and Nicodemus met from time to time over the next three years. I would like to think they did. But if they didn't, that one particular conversation that we've heard read this morning, that is what impacted Nicodemus, and I think he started evolving, he started growing, and he started listening to Jesus during all of those debates and conversations that go on in the life of Jesus. And it had a profound impact. And, and while it may have taken a while for Nicodemus to fully get on board, this final act we have recorded of Nicodemus, it's proof enough for me that Nicodemus finally went all in for Jesus. And why do I think that? Why do I think, man, this was the moment he went all in for Jesus? I, I want to talk about just a little piece of that scripture. Again, if we glossed over it, we'll miss something very important. But a symbol of his going all in for Jesus can be found in the scripture just, just read regarding that mixture of spices that he brought to anoint Jesus' body for burial. I want you to look back or think back on the amount of spices that Nicodemus brought for the burial. If we're not careful, we'll miss it. He brought 100 pounds of spices for this burial ceremony. If you don't know about customary Jewish burials in the first century, that is an extraordinary amount. A pretty normal amount of burial spices for a body, for, for a Jew who has passed away, would be about 5 pounds. Nicodemus brought 100. Do you know how much uh, money that would have cost in today's money for Nicodemus to bring that 100 pounds of spices, myrrh, aloes? Well, listen to this. Conservative estimates is that it would have cost Nicodemus in, our, in today's money around two hundred dollars to $300,000. That's how much it would have cost. Now, some translations will say 75 pounds. Some will say 100 pounds. doesn't matter. We're, we're getting there. It's, you know that it's an extraordinary amount, right? Now, do you know who would have received such an extravagant burial in that time and space? No one. No one with the exception of one. And that exception was when a king was buried. Nicodemus, at the end of the day, essentially said, my king will have a royal burial. It was a certain sign, a certain gesture of Nicodemus to say, I am all in. Remember I talked about the cover, the veil of darkness that he went to Jesus in? This is the light of day. Right? Those Pharisees, that, uh, that elite group, they were there at the crucifixion. I have no doubt about that. They wanted to make sure this Jesus died. Okay? And they wanted to watch this execution. And they wanted to tell everybody else, you do not go against the grain of us. And I have a good feeling that Nicodemus was there at the crucifixion. 
The one who originally came under the veil of darkness now does the most honorable act in the light of day for the burial of Jesus. Now, I don't know what happened to Nicodemus. We have some extra biblical sources that take some guesses, but that's all they are, are guesses. Now, my educated guess is uh, common sense tells me that this didn't fly over well with his colleagues. And I'm pretty confident that Nicodemus paid a great price for this, for this act that he did, for this uh, burial ceremony that he helped Joseph of Arimathea with because it was there in the open. You'd, it, it would have been seen by most. Calvary up on a hill, they did that on purpose so all the people could see. If you go against the Roman Empire, this is what will happen to you. They made it as a deterrent. It's been a good deterrent for me. But what I'm saying is everybody saw what happened when Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus did what they did. But at that point, I don't think Nicodemus cared what others thought. Uh, because what he witnessed at the cross, again, I don't have 100% proof that he was there, but what he witnessed at the cross confirmed what he heard from Jesus in his initial conversation that God loved him, that God gave his son for him, and whoever believes in him will have eternal life. In chapter 3, where we have been concentrating, Jesus stared into the eyes of a Pharisee and did not exempt him, did not exempt his greatest enemy from the greatest good, and that is the gospel. That even Nicodemus could be saved. And when Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, can you imagine how that hit the soul of Nicodemus? Which tells me what the Apostle Paul wrote over and over again, that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it all came into focus, I think, for Nicodemus at Calvary. And I think it was there that he said, you know what? Forget everything else. I'm all in. I believe. And in the light of day, I will take care of my King. Now, this morning, you get two sermons for the price of one. Okay? That was the first one. You ready for the second one? Some are like, I don't, I don't know. Uh, John 3.16 is the gospel in a nutshell. I believe that because what it tells us is that God was all in for you and me, not only for us, but for the whole world, for His enemies, for whoever places their faith in Him, can be saved, and that is the good news. It is the best news. So if you are ever walking along on a snowy road and a dude jumps out of a snow bank and asks you, what is the gospel of Jesus? You can rightfully say, rightfully quote John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Then I would encourage you to run fast because nobody, <laughs> nobody needs to be jumping out of a snow bank and talking to you. But you can rightfully say it's John 3.16 because it is the gospel in a nutshell. But if I had to tell you what my favorite book of the Bible is, if I, if I was put into a corner and I can only pick one, and I love the gospel of John, but I absolutely adore the book of 1 John. And what I want you to do this morning uh, is turn over to the book of 1 John. Uh, it's, it's towards the end of the New Testament, if you're not familiar. We find three short little books, short little texts, all attributed to the Apostle John. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. I absolutely have been transformed by this brief little five-chapter text. And I've studied it a lot. But not too long ago, a few years back, I was studying the book of 1 John. And I realized something that just hit me like a lightning bolt. That actually one of my favorite verses in 1 John is chapter 3, verse 16. 1 John 3, 16. And here's what it says, and you can turn to it if you like. But it says, we know love by this, that Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. Therefore we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Now, if John 3.16 is the gospel in a nutshell, 1 John 3.16 
is the mark of a healthy and thriving church, in my opinion. Jesus demonstrated what true love is at the cross. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. True love, this is how we know love. It's sacrificial love. And we ought to do the same in loving others, in loving our neighbors, in loving our enemies, in loving the stranger, sacrificially. Now, we more than likely will not get the opportunity to literally lay down our lives like Jesus did. But there are an infinite number of ways in which we can be sacrificial in our love for others. And I believe it is, they are the best way. When we are sacrificial in our love, it is the best way to show others who God is and what God is like. When we sacrifice, sacrificially love one another. It is the best prelude to a conversation about how Jesus sacrificially loved us and the world. When we are sacrificial with our love, we lay down our selfishness, we lay down our agendas, we lay down our prerequisites, we lay down our judgments, and we love how God loved us sacrificially. Now, the word for God's love that's talked about in the New Testament is the Greek word agape. And you may have heard that term before. It's the word used in both the Gospel of John 3.16 and 1 John 3.16. And agape is a form of love that is exactly what I just described. It, it doesn't have a self-agenda, no expectation of getting love in return. It is unconditional. Agape is love that loves because it's love. That's all it is. Agape says, I'm all in for you. Regardless of your state of returning it to me, I'm all in for you. I think it's perfectly described in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul wrote this. God proved His love for us. God proved His agape for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you see how that agape works? While we were yet sinners, that's when the love was perfectly demonstrated for us. What that means is that we didn't give God a reason to love us. We didn't merit God's love. In fact, we were in a place where we weren't going towards God's love. Uh, we weren't even in neutral. We were in reverse, heading away from God's love. While we were sinners, that's when it was perfectly manifested in Jesus, that love. And this is the kind of love that the church is to express to one another and to the world. It is one of the biggest parts of our mission here as a church, as Christians, as followers of Christ. And this is the kind of thing that can change the world. And Jesus showed us the way. We know love by this. We understand what agape is when He died on the cross. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. Therefore, we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Remember what Jesus told Nicodemus? Another so celebrated, famous passage of Scripture there in chapter 3. Billy Graham was so famous preaching about it that you must be born again. What does that say to you? Well, not to be too morbid, but that means a death must occur if you're going to be born again. Jesus told His crew, if you want to become My disciples, take up your cross daily and follow Me. There's no ending to the cross except for a death. Okay, that's, The Romans were really good at killing people. That's how they did it. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow Me. And, and the Apostle Paul said over and over again that Christ means you become a new creation. The old is gone. The old is dead. The new has come. And he wrote, I've been crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, but Jesus now lives in me. We already heard 1 John. We ought to lay down our lives for one another. All of this is saying loud and clear to me, and I hope it is to you, that this is the commitment that we are to make with God, that we are to make with one another. Because of the work of Christ, it is committing to be all in. This is what I'll ask of you. Not to get the cart before the horse, but if you indeed call me to be your pastor. And that is to be all in. Because the world is in crisis. The church 
is in crisis. It is past time to be halfway about Jesus and His church, not asking for perfection. I hope that you won't ask me for perfection. It's an impossible ask. But what I will ask is for us to be all in, to be sacrificial in our love for one another, for Jesus, for this city, and beyond. Because the one who gave up everything deserves that kind of commitment, right? And if we are sincere about it, I promise, I think God promises that we will see some of the most thriving, healthy years this church has ever seen. But it has to be, and we talked about this yesterday in our meeting time together. Thank you for those that were here uh, yesterday. I really appreciated that time. But th we talked about it being a shared commitment. It has to be a shared commitment. The kind of success for the kingdom of God we want to see will be seen not because of a single individual. A healthy, thriving church for the kingdom of God becomes that way because at some point their membership collectively said in one way or another, I'm all in for Jesus. And I'm here today for that reason. I believe as God has called me to call you to be all in and to see this church become all God desires for it to be. And I believe that we can see that if we have a shared collective commitment. Now, it doesn't take a biblical scholar to see this going on. Uh, this going all in is the case in so many stories throughout the Bible. The story of Abraham, he and Sarah had to give up everything, leave their land, their country, and go to a place that God had called them to. The story of Moses to go to the most powerful man on the planet at the time, uh, the Pharaoh of Egypt, and, and he said, let my people go. The story of Daniel to tell the king, I will not pray to you, but to the God of Israel only. Ultimately, to be thrown into the lion's den, that's being all in. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, to not bow down to an earthly king and worship him and to make the choice to be thrown into a fiery furnace, that's being all in. The story of the apostles who all ultimately went to their death because of their unrelenting proclamation of Jesus resurrected. The Apostle Paul, who gave up everything that the world said was profitable for a man. He said, I, I count all that but rubbish compared to knowing Christ. Do you see the theme here? The theme is all in. With the ultimate perfect example, of course, being Jesus. We're called to be like Jesus. The Apostle Paul in Philippians said... You need to have the mindset of Jesus, the mind of Christ, who being, who didn't consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. He took the very nature of a servant. He came in appearance as a man, and he humbled himself to death. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's all in. And friends, I want to be forthright with you and say, and I hope this doesn't scare you, but it, it needs to, we need to think about this responsibility. We are it. Okay? The baton has been passed to us for such a time as this. We are His representatives here on earth. There's a, a made-up story. Uh, and you're not going to find this in your Bible, so don't go home looking for it. But I think it drives home a pretty good point. It's a made-up story about when Jesus returned to heaven. Death, burial, resurrection, ascension to heaven. And He's there with the angels. And they're rejoicing. And the angels want to hear all about uh, His life and ministry here on earth. And Jesus tells them. He talks about His life. He talks about being a model uh, for this group of men and women. And, and he talks about his, his death, uh, the betrayal, the arrest, his death, his, his resurrection, and, and the good news that was given, the gospel that was given, that God loves them, that God loves humanity. The archangel, Michael, raised his hand. 
and said, well, Jesus, what happens next? And Jesus said, well, I have left a group of men and women and I, I have left them to, to carry on this message, this way, this truth, this life, this gospel, and they will carry it on. They will pass it on and they will spread the news to the world that Jesus Christ has come and the kingdom is now at hand. And then Gabriel asked a second question. Did I say Gabriel? Michael? Okay, one of the archangels. Michael said, but Jesus, what if they fail? What then is the plan? And Jesus didn't hesitate and he responded, there is no other plan. We are it. We are the representatives of Jesus on earth. We are his ambassadors. We are to take the gospel to this city and to the world. We are to love like he did sacrificially. We are to be all in. God has given us everything. His Son, the Holy Spirit, each other. Ours is the responsibility. We are the instruments for the distribution of God's love and God's truth. And what a great responsibility, but what a privilege we have to be in Christ and to be trusted with the gospel. The gospel, John 3.16, and then how we are to play that out. 1 John 3.16, may this be a day, may this be a season where we commit to be all in for Jesus. Will you join me in that? Let's pray together. Uh, gracious and loving God, I'm, I'm so thankful for this opportunity to be with this family of faith. Uh, I'm thankful for your love for each and every one of us. I'm thankful that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, believes in Him, will not perish but have everlasting life. And then to live a life like Christ, to sacrificially love one another, uh, to propagate this gospel uh, to our city and to the world. And God, I pray that whatever happens today, that we might look to you, the author, perfecter of our faith, and find the courage and the will and the resolve to be all in for Jesus. Because ultimately you are all in for us. We are eternally grateful for abundant life here on earth, eternal life in heaven. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. This time we're going to enter into a time of commitment, a time of invitation. And thank you so much for the opportunity this morning. I invite you to uh, stand. And I believe it's 384. It is. 384. Uh, Dr. Keith has prepared and presented the Word of God, the powerful Word of God, the ultimate truth for all time. We have a chance now to respond. If God is speaking to you and, uh, and there's something you need to share, this invitation is open to you. If you are not a member of this church, but you would like to join this church as we go all in for God, uh, the invitation is for you. And it is the custom of this church, if this is a Sunday near your birthday or anniversary and you would just like to publicly say uh, we're going to live this next year all in for God. This invitation is for you. Let us sing.
Uh, you see in the bulletin, and if those of you are going to watch this uh, service uh, later, uh, there is a new study that's to begin. John Pumphrey Sunday School class is uh, going to start transforming grace, living confidently in God's unfailing love. And if you haven't found a Sunday School class yet, uh, that would be a good one. So I invite you to that. Also, you'll see uh, new beginnings uh, are in, in desperate need of uh, some large size diapers and some other things. Uh, uh, so pay attention to that. Also, come to the table in our bulletin. You see there are several items uh, that are, would be very good to bring to come to the table. In just a moment, we are going to have a benediction, but I would uh, tell you some things that are going to go on. Uh, when we have, uh, uh, after the benediction, Cynthia is going to be playing. And if you are not a member of First Baptist Church, then certainly uh, you do not have to stay, but we will have a business meeting. Uh, and while Cynthia is playing, uh, ballots will be pa being passed out. So uh, uh, I remind you of that. Let us go to God in prayer. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for your love expressed to us in such a powerful way. We thank you that we have been able to hear your word expressed and pray that we would go all in for you. And we ask now, Lord, that you would uh, bless us and keep us let your face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. And Lord, lift up your countenance upon us and give us peace now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. If you would be seated, if you uh, need to leave, then certainly leave. Uh, but I believe some people are passing out ballots to have a vote here. Missy, Missy, are we ready or not recording? All right, all right. We'll call this meeting to order. I want to thank you all for attending the special call business meeting today. We are here to vote on a candidate brought to us by the Pastoral Search Committee. <laughs> 